The Galactic Empire is the personification of evil. It's a massive, oppressive, authoritarian regime, which is run by an evil space wizard who uses legions of faceless stormtroopers and mighty fleets of star destroyers to quell all opposition. The Empire takes and steals from the weak, and it also grabs all of the resources and manpower of the galaxy and feeds it into its ravenous military industrial complex. If you aren't sure about just how evil the Empire is, take a look at their enemies. It includes this all-American, innocent-looking moisture farmer, a young and beautiful innocent princess, and this old, wise, and humble man wearing a robe and these adorable semi-sentient teddy bears, who the Empire massacre, and then they proceed to waste all of that good meat. If that isn't evil, then I don't know what is. And that's kind of the problem. You know, on this channel, I oftentimes joke that the, uh, the original trilogy was written by New Republic and Rebel sympathizers, and, you know, it's not a throwaway line. I mean, a lot of the stuff I say is nonsense, but this is not a joke. I'm serious about this. George Lucas wrote the original trilogy with the mindset of an anti-war activist. He had been a strong opponent of the Vietnam War, and he was born in 1944, so his generation was raised by the Great One that drove the Nazis from Europe to the dark side of the moon. The inspiration behind the Galactic Empire is clear. From the sharp-looking Hugo Boss-inspired uniforms to the knee-high jackboots, we know exactly what George was up to. And so it's kind of obvious that he wasn't really objective when he wrote this story, and he, he really doesn't need to be. Let, let, me, let me add that, by the way, he doesn't need to be. But this was clearly a very black and white story about good versus evil. And in 1977, when Star Wars came out, these were bold and important statements to make. But it's been almost half a century since then, and there have been plenty of copycats and homages paid to this sci-fi fantasy universe, which is really just the mirror of our own. And in those five decades, the movie industry and storytelling has changed drastically, and audiences and their media literacy has also advanced. Today, these early interpretations of the Empire are still visually awe-inspiring, but as an organization, they seem almost cartoonishly evil and therefore unrealistic as an organization. And at one point, the modern viewer is going to ask the question, if the Galactic Empire is so evil, then why did people join? Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! It's a really good question, and one of the interesting things that Disney Star Wars has done in recent years is follow what I like to call the Timothy Zahn approach to Star Wars, which means creating a more realistic universe that tries to humanize everyone, not only the Rebels, but also the Empire, so that it's no longer just some cartoonish evil organization, but a real functioning organization that is full of pretty normal, everyday people, which I think makes the Empire even more terrifying. Speaking about humanizing the other side, one of the biggest problems we face in today's media landscape is just the sheer amount of information being published out there. No matter how smart you are or how much time you have, it's just impossible to sort through everything. And that is a really big problem. A misinformed population is a vulnerable one. And so today's sponsor is very unique. It's Ground News. And it's unique because I actually pursued them and asked them to sponsor my channel, which is usually not how it happens. Ground News aggregates all of the top news stories of the day, but it does far more than a simple news aggregator. Ground News then shows the reader which side of the political spectrum is covering the subject. You'll quickly find out that the right and the left have their own clearly defined narratives about what is going on in the world, which is why it seems like we're becoming more and more polarized as we sort off into our individual political bubbles. In Ground News, each individual news organization also has their own profile, which shows who owns them, which country they come from, and what their political bias and factuality rating is. Ground News uses multiple independent third-party organizations to come up with these ratings. They also have a page called Blindspot, which I really like, and this features less popular stories that are usually only reported on by one side of the political spectrum. With Ground News, you no longer need to feel overwhelmed by all of those news stories that are flashing in your inbox or whatever news aggregator you use. Think of Ground News not as just a news agency, but as a tool to help you decipher all of the bias and agendas out in the world. It'll show you the entire news picture if you let it. We'll be linking Ground News in the description below if you guys are interested. I highly recommend you at least check out the free trial so you see what it is. And if you guys want to subscribe to it and support it, you get unlimited access. Well, thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. In the Aftermath trilogy, we're introduced to Ray Sloan, a 
hardworking and legitimately kind-hearted Imperial who rises to the highest ranks of the organization because of her competence. Ray Sloan believed in the Empire because as a child she lived on a planet that was overrun by slavers and gangs, which severely hurt the security and economic prosperity of her family. In Lost Stars, we follow Sienna Ree, an ace TIE fighter pilot who is present at many of the major battles of the Galactic Civil War and is able to show us the Imperial side of the war. Sienna Ree came from a very impoverished backwater planet and it's thanks to the Imperial Academy system that she would eventually receive and education. Then we have the single player campaign in Battlefront 2, which featured Imperial Special Forces Commando Iden Versio, another good natured Imperial. Iden Versio hails from the world of Vardos, which received a lot of economic and political support when it joined the Empire. There's also Rogue One and Andor, which didn't necessarily showcase good Imperials, but instead it focused on bad and chaotic rebels like Saw Guerrero. Now, some of you guys might be saying, hey, Alan, isn't it dangerous if we make the bad guys look good and we make the good guys look bad? I mean, which side are you on anyway? Well, I would argue, um, you know, how are you gonna know which side to join if you're not focused on the truth first? Isn't that the most important step in any kind of decision-making process? Isn't telling lies far more dangerous? If we tell people that the rebels can do no wrong and the Empire can do nothing but evil, then what happens when those people see things like Sagar torturing people or his partisans endangering innocent bystanders with their shootouts? What happens when we see citizens, not just any citizen, but alien citizens who love the Empire? This immediately shatters the narrative that the rebels are completely good and the Empire is completely evil and xenophobic. It shatters this kind of black and white view of the galaxy. And once people have been lied to, oftentimes they head towards the world of conspiracy, cynicism, alternative facts. Ultimately, these individuals will choose the side you were trying to prevent them from joining in the first place. And it is definitely the individual who makes up the lies fault. I mean, if you really believe in your cause, if you really believe in your message, then you shouldn't try to hide the truth. You should focus on the truth. Don't be arrogant. Don't think that you need to lie to people. Trust in your fellow man and woman that they can sort through the information themselves as long as you give them an opportunity to. Because building up trust can take years and years of truth and one lie can shatter everything. So let's do a deeper dive into the empire. Why did some people enjoy living underneath its rule, even though it clearly was a very parasitic and oppressive government? Well, first of all, every policy is going to have more than one side effect, right? For instance, the massive military buildup of the empire had many positive short-term effects that would eventually be outweighed by all the waste and lack of real economic development it created. But the Clone Wars, which you know technically was started by the Emperor, or Emperor Palpatine at least, left the entire galaxy devastated. On many planets that hosted Clone Wars battlefields, you had entire cities destroyed, the infrastructure in shambles, and chronic interruptions in the supply of basic goods needed for survival. And so the Empire's focus on militarization actually created millions, if not billions, of jobs. Palpatine took over the banking system in the last year of the Clone Wars and was also able to print the credits needed to fund such a program. The Empire needed a lot of people. It needed factory workers, it needed sailors, soldiers, pilots, it needed bureaucrats, administrators. And because of this, because of this large program in their academy system, individuals like Sienna Ree were able to basically be lifted out of poverty and leave her home world to go see the rest of the galaxy. I remember even Luke Skywalker was attracted by a similar promise for adventure. And if these new droids do work out, I want to transmit my application to the Academy this year. You mean the next semester before the harvest? Sure, there's more than enough droids. Harvest is when I need you the most. Yeah, if you can believe it, in an alternative universe, maybe Luke Skywalker ends up flying TIE fighters instead of X-Wings. The increased Imperial security presence might not have solved all of the galaxy's instability, but it definitely created a lot more stability in the core regions of the galaxy. Vardos, for instance, was routinely being attacked by bandits and pirates before the Empire accepted them. Located in the Janata system in the core, Vardos became known as an Imperial Utopia and it countered many of the narratives created by the Rebellion. For instance, Vardos had a very diverse alien population that was also extremely loyal to the Empire. On worlds like Quat or Fondor, which had large shipyards and military works, business boomed and capital investment flowed in from the central government. And that was just one of the genius parts of Palpatine's plan. You see, he wasn't just interested in running the entire galaxy. He also wanted to ensure the loyalty of his subjects by giving them jobs. 
It's one thing to be oppressed by the empire, have your land stolen and then be forced to work in their factories. That creates a rebel. But when you voluntarily join the empire, get indoctrinated and become a part of the very system that is oppressing you, but also paying you, it'll become very difficult to leave. Then on super prosperous worlds like Coruscant, things pretty much don't really change for the people living there. Empire, rebels, new republic, I can't keep track. That's why I should just keep my mouth shut. The elite are always insulated by their power and wealth, and while entire Outer Rim worlds were getting ravaged by the Empire's military industrial complex, Palpatine made sure that the influential people who controlled what remained of the private sector and various political movements on Coruscant were happy and satisfied with the state of affairs. Even the most powerful dictators cannot get by without the support of at least a small portion of their populace. Surveillance and prosecution, without limit. If you're doing nothing wrong, what is there to fear? I'm fearing your definition of wrong. And this is the truth of humanity. We are short-sighted individuals. We're cowardly. We can be fearful. Governments like the Empire can prey on that aspect in our personalities and at least initially offer us what seems like the solutions to the problems we face. And in some cases, like in CNRE's case, things kind of work out until they don't at the Battle of Jakku. I mean, more often than not, wisdom shows us that governments based on the rule of one individual without any checks and balances usually lead to complete disaster. Oftentimes, it's not even because of intent. Governance is just really hard and honestly not something one person can just do by themselves. In a normal, more balanced political system with limited terms, usually incompetent individuals or people who fail get voted out. But when authoritarians stay in power for a long time, even if they are completely incompetent, they usually are able to consolidate power within their government and maintain that power for extended periods of time, usually when they gain access to the military. You know, Palpatine didn't start off as an authoritarian. When the empire was established, there was still an imperial senate, one that was slowly stripped of its power in the next decade or so before it was completely banned. But I would argue that the opposition really sharpened Palpatine's skills and abilities and made him a better politician. Palpatine was in his prime when he was a senator and chancellor for the Republic. He had to keep his motivations hidden and he had to achieve goals using the Republic systems. He won his opposition over to his side and many of the leaders of the rebellion from Bail Organa to Mon Mothma were even members of his loyalist committee. His brave defense of the Republic during the Clone Wars, his survival during that Jedi assassination attempt made the galaxy adore him. That was completely real. The Empire ultimately didn't collapse because of the rebellion. The Empire collapsed because it started doing crazy things when it feared it was losing control. Palpatine in the last year of the war had basically lost his mind. He had become a hermit, completely retreated from the public eye, and was focused on ancient Sith prophecies, mysterious disturbances in the unknown region, immortality, and of course, giant super lasers. He didn't even properly conduct a plan to counter the rebellion's assault on Imperial worlds. He kind of just let things collapse. It was at this point that the people who were happy to live underneath the Empire, that's when they saw their lives drastically changed for the worse. The Empire would blow up Alderaan as an example to the rest of the galaxy of what would happen if they rebelled. And after the Battle of Endor, the Empire began attacking its own worlds in retribution. Remember Vardos? Well, the Imperial Remnants sent a bunch of weather satellites to the planet, which caused superstorms that killed the majority of the population. And that foolish senator who had that line about if you're not doing anything wrong, then you have nothing to fear. Well, he reminds me of the story of a German Lutheran pastor named Martin Neimoller. He initially sympathized with the Nazi movement in the 20s and 30s, but when Hitler took over in 1937, he started actively protesting against them. He was known for this very famous quote that I believe he wrote in prison. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Extremism usually forms within a bubble. And within a bubble, you're usually blinded from the truth, and you only hear the narrative being repeated by your side. And that makes you really ill-equipped to deal with the world. And I think if you've learned any lesson from my channel, my various videos that I've done, um, it's this. I don't actually really care what your political views are, whether you're uh, left wing or right wing or centrist or an extremist. This is why I usually don't get too partisan here. You know, I stay in the middle. And that's because what I really care about is that people are informed properly when they come to those conclusions that you have access to truthful information. That is why I really went out of my way to get the sponsor from Ground News. 
And if you guys do have a moment, at least check it out. Check out the free trial. Take a look at the blind spot section and maybe take a look at political views that are opposed to yourself and you might be surprised to see what you find there. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.